Uh, my name is Brent Alexander Cruz, and I am a genealogist. I've been studying particularly Hispano genealogy for 39 years, and I just wrote a book, my first book, uh, about the ancestry of Francisco Montes Vigil. I trace that back 46 generations in Asturias in northern Spain. So we're going to start off with Brent. Him and I have had this long dialogue on email, two different email accounts, both of us, back and forth, um, about the book, the Montes Vigil book. Jose Antonio Escabel has piped in on Goodreads and give, given it a very good book review. Um, Marieta Gonzalez and Jose are working on revising her part of the Francisco Montes Vigil book that she had done over a decade ago. It's been a long time, right, Ron? Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on with the Vigil family because of what Brent has uncovered. And so um, really looking forward to hearing from him. He came all the way from Walsenburg yesterday. So down the mountain, through the valley, through the snow, through another valley, through the winds, yeah. And he finally got here, so we're really excited about that. Um, I don't know if all of you have seen the bio on him. I'm just going to read a part of it. <clears throat> but you're a native Coloradoan. He is, yeah, a long time. Um, he's spent 37 years pursuing his genealogical research, so even about the same as length as me. I think that's scary. Um, he's a lay member of the Confraternity of the Passion, a fan of the Beach Boys, part of the SAR. Uh, his family settled in Colorado in 1864, um, and he's a Denver Bronco fan. So, you know, he's just a typical Colorado guy. <laughs> Yeah, most of, oh, there's like half cowboy fans here, so you have to kind of know that. So I'm just going to turn this over to him and let him um, take control of his talk. This morning we'll do questions after, and um, we just want to have everybody have a great day today. So, Brent? Uh, yeah, we should be able to, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, they said uh, speak into the mic. Can everybody can hear me okay? Um, let's see, so well, I'd uh, just like to thank everybody for coming and uh, I'll get started here with the uh, 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 slides. First thing I want to do is thank the Society and thank Henrietta and Miguel for asking me to come and uh, I hope that uh, people enjoy the uh, presentation. The, there are going to be three parts of it. First, I'm going to discuss my book, kind of uh, uh, tell you what it's about, give you a sense, uh, so people might be thinking about possibly buying it, or um, I could, I'm going to tell you a little about the book, and then I'm also going to talk about doing what I've learned, doing medieval uh, genealogy in Spain, and then uh, the last part, uh, a few people had asked me to really show how uh, one of these lineages was developed that's in the book, and then I'd like to just sort of share a few concluding remarks kind of uh, about uh, gene genealogy. And, uh, okay, uh, I'll begin here with the, uh, the cover of the book features the, the uh, uh, cross of uh, La Cruz de la Victoria, the cross of Asturias. It's the national kingdom of uh, Asturias. And uh, in terms of the title, that is a quotation from a statement that was made about the Vigil family in the 1600s by one of the uh, nobles up in Asturias in 1611 saying that they were one of the most ancient and noble families in the kingdom. And so I thought that that was kind of a nice description. Uh, the subtitle, I call it a preliminary study because I had originally wanted to do something sort of like Fray Angelico Chavez had done where there would be a detailed biography of each person but when I reached the point of having several hundred people and then over a thousand people, that just became kind of uh, out of the question. So uh, I'm hoping other people that this work isn't sort of an end, but it's a beginning that other people will be inspired to kind of look at these sources and look at these people and perhaps do some more uh, work there. Uh, let's see. I just wanted to say a little about how I first got interested in genealogy. It was because of uh, roots. I started in 1979 helping my dad, and he had uh, was very fortunate. He came from a family where genealogy had been appreciated, and so we had a great deal of information. 
My mother's family was the opposite. She had, uh, her mother had passed away and she was a little girl and her mother's mother had had the same experience. That's her there on the, the right. Her name is, uh, was Elsie Medina. That's my grandmother. And we knew very little. We didn't even know whether she had born in, in the United States or not. And so it was by really uncovering her family tree that I was able to find a connection to the V Hills. And she actually has descended four different ways from Francisco Montes V Hill. And so when I started to put together a chart trying to understand how they related, that was when I really uh, became interested in uh, that family. Um, now, talking about Frangelico, or uh, the, uh, uh, how I started working on the V Hills, of course, the starting point, as for all of us, is uh, Frangelico's Origins of New Mexico Families. And uh, he is somebody that uh, I think we all sort of look up to. And uh, I started from his work, and if uh, people here remember, in 1996, an article came out in the journal Erencia. It had two wills of Juan Montes Vigil III and the uh, Pasajero record from 1611, which uh, gave some information taking people back. Uh, and then there was this really wonderful article that came out in 2005 by uh, Marietta V. Hill Gonzalez, Charles Martinez V. Hill, and Jose Antonio Esquivel, where they went back to the 1300s. At the time, they thought around 1350, but it was probably actually closer to 1300. And uh, so that was where I started from, and uh, just really wanted to see if I could, could get back. And then uh, this is a site that I think all of us, <laughs> all of us who are genealogists are familiar with, the, the brick wall. Uh, I literally spent three years working on the V Hill family and had nothing to show for it. N nothing, not, not a, a single shred of paper. Uh, very discouraging. But then finally, one day, um, so miraculously, in 2012, on a source called Google Books, I came across a multi volume set called Asturias Illustrata, which had first been published in 1760. And in that book, uh, I found, uh, if you can see there on uh, page 125, it was uh, book one of volume three. They have a mention of Catalina de Arguez, who was married to Francisco V. Hill. And uh, so that was really wonderful. That was the, the breakthrough, finding that page that was able, uh, we were able to connect Francisco Montes V. Hill from New Mexico with all of these families going back into the, uh, the Middle Ages. Um, so after, after I found that, there were, uh, this is a very important source, the nobiliario of uh, the Conde de Barcelos. Uh, that's av available online. Google Books, as I said, uh, they have millions of books available uh, th where the copyright has expired. Another really wonderful source of information is the Internet Archive. You can look, there's some duplication with, uh, with Google Books, but again, these are books where the copyright has expired and you can uh, access millions of different things from, the, uh, from your own home. Uh, Wikipedia, I wanted to say a few words about. This is a major online encyclopedia. I have the entry here for the uh, uh, Principality of Asturias. It's a wonderful, uh, source of information, but you have to be really careful because the articles there are only as good as the people who have submitted them. And so you never want to use it as a primary source, but you look at the bibliography. And so uh, it, it can save you literally thousands of hours of time, but you just have to be very cautious uh, because some of the things are just really incorrect, but then other things there are, are done by experts. So you really have to see who's, who's writing the article. And what I found, if you're doing genealogy in Spain, you really want to look at the corresponding article in Spanish Wikipedia rather than just the English language because maybe the English language will just have one paragraph and the Spanish one would have three or four paragraphs. Uh, another really great source, if you're interested in medieval genealogy, is a, uh, something called the Medieval Lands Project by a British scholar named Charles Cawley, that was started in 2006 at the uh, Foundation for Medieval Genealogy. He is trying to put together basically a, uh, a uh, 
database of all of the nobles and royals for all of the Western European countries, starting from uh, about the year 1000 down to like 1500. Uh, another source is the uh, on Ancestry.com, the Medieval Discussion Group. Uh, there are many different threads you can follow. And I mention all these, these things in the book and I give the full citations. The only thing with this, I would just say, uh, are people here, uh, some people familiar with that old TV show from the 1980s called Dynasty? If you remember Alexis and Crystal, well, unfortunately, the level of um, conversation among the genealogists at this place really reminds me a lot of that, which, which isn't a good thing. But if you can deal with the cattiness and the kind of infighting and sarcasm and stuff, it it's really does have some good information buried there. Uh, one of the people there, Douglas Richardson, this is a wonderful source for people there doing uh, no, uh, noble or uh, royal ancestry from the uh, Middle Ages. Uh, other sources are just kind of your traditional history books. Those have a lot of things in it. And if you're creative, travel guides, books about architecture, booklets, they're put about local history, travel blogs, genealogy web pages, modern scholarly articles, uh, church documents. I'll say a little more about that uh, uh, later on, but that's also very important. Uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with this. I'm not sure if the colors are coming out. This is the ancient crest of the Vigil family. It's a red field with a white castle on it. Uh, the Vigil family, as we know about, that we're, we're talking about now, uh, arose the main line probably around the year 1000. Uh, there are many different theories as, as to how the name originated, but it probably originated from a place. There's a town in Asturias called Vigil, but uh, in the Asturian uh, dialect of Spanish, it would be spelled with an X, V-I-X-I-L. It would be pronounced the same. But we have to remember, V-I-G-I-L is actually the Spanish spelling. Um, and speaking of Asturias, the, uh, if you look on this map up there on the northern coast between Galicia and Cantabria, that's Asturias. It's very small and it's quite different from the uh, rest of Spain. I think most of us, when we think of Spain, you think of La Mancha, you think of the wide open skies and the flat land and very dry. And here's the typical scene in Asturias. Uh, it's very green, they, they have mountains, they have valleys, and uh, it lies on the coast of Verde. It really is sort of part of the uh, extended Celtic world. The, uh, this is the flag of Asturias, it's the, uh, the cross there. And as you can see, here are the uh, so-called eight Celtic nations. You have uh, Cornwall, the Isle of Man, <laughs> Scotland, uh, Brittany in France, Galicia, Wales, Ireland, and then down there you see the cross of Asturias, and so the people there are very proud of that, uh, that kind of heritage. This is actually a picture of the, the so-called uh, Cruz de la Victoria. It is the national symbol of Asturias. The formative event in their history, the Battle of Covadonga, was fought in 722. This was when a very tiny Christian force defeated a much larger Muslim force and this really was the first time that anybody had stopped the Muslim takeover of Spain. And uh, another, uh, Our Lady, this is the image of Our Lady of Covadonga. This was a, uh, a uh, statue that was there that uh, a lot of the people credited her intercession for helping the, uh, the Spanish win this, this very one-sided battle. And so she is sort of, just as Our Lady of Guadalupe is beloved to uh, Mexicans and Mexican-Americans, our Lady of Covadonga is beloved by the uh, people of Asturias, not only in Spain, but uh, as they spread around the, uh, the world. Now we see up there, uh, uh, the people of Asturias are very proud. That's the only part of Spain that was never conquered by the, uh, the Muslims. The, up there, the Kingdom of Asturias. This is a map from about 750. And then by 1037, you see how the Reconquista is underway. Uh, uh, Asturias has been subsumed into the Kingdom of Leon, and then finally, by the time we get to the uh, time of, say, Columbus, all that was left of the Muslim Spain was the Kingdom of Granada down there at the very south, and uh, Leon had been subsumed into Castile. Now, speaking of this time period, some of Francisco Montes Vigil's ancestors were making history. Uh, this is King Alfonso IX, who was born around seven. 
1171, he married Berengaria of Castile, who was the daughter of King Alfonso VIII. This is the first royal ancestor of Francisco Montes de Hill, who uh, I, I discovered. He's his 14th great-grandfather. Uh, another important figure is Charlemagne, called the father of Europe. He was the ruler of France, Germany, and Italy. He was the first person around the year 800. He was the first person since the fall of the Roman Empire to have that uh, title. Uh, another great ancestor was El Cid, uh, the uh, Rodrigo Diaz de Vivar, the great folk hero of Spain. He sort of, uh, as we all know, like the equivalent of, of what King Arthur is to the British people the epitome of what a gallant, uh, gallant knight should be. And actually, they made a blockbuster movie a long time ago about Al Cid. Uh, Charlton Heston was the, uh, played Al Cid, even though I don't think he's Spanish. And Sophia Loren was the, the love interest, the lovely Sophia Loren. And she's very dramatic there, as you can see. So uh, the movie didn't do very well at the box office, but I, I think it's interesting. Uh, one of the things that was surprising to me, at least in doing this research, was to really see the international background that somebody like Francisco Montes Vigil, who has all of these noble and royal ancestors, has. Of course, he's uh, had Asturian, Galician, Castilian, Catalonian, and Navarrese ancestry. But you see here, he had ancestors that are Danish, Italian, French, uh, Muslim, German, English, Scottish, Greek, and Portuguese. So you really see that the uh, nobles and royalty, even at that time, Hundreds of years ago, there, there, there was intermarriage. And so just a very interesting mix in terms of the, the DNA, I would think. You go back far enough in the mages and you come to sort of the era of mythology. And this is Woden, the supreme god of the Norse pantheon, who is allegedly one of the ancestors of the Anglo-Saxon king. So he should be, he's theoretically in the family tree, the guy that uh, <laughs> namesake of Wednesday, and even more, uh, astonishing, uh, this, I had never heard of this, is a quinitar. It's a sea monster with five horns, and that is allegedly the father of uh, Merovec, who is the uh, founder of the Merovingian family, the original <laughs> French dynasty that uh, we've probably, all of us have heard a lot about through that, you know, whole Da Vinci Code thing. But he is actually there in the family tree of uh, Francisco uh, Montes Vigil, if, if, if you believe that sort of thing. Um, going back to Asturias here, the uh, uh, interesting discovery, the Vigils were one of the most important families in the whole kingdom. There were really six families that uh, pretty much ran the show in Asturias during the Middle Ages. The Quiros, Valdez, Miranda, Guzman, Arguez, and Vigil. And every single one of these is in Francisco's family tree. There was a great deal of intermarriage uh, among the nobility there, just as you often find throughout the world. This is an, ex is an example that everybody here in New Mexico who studied it would be familiar with. Juan Montes Vigil, uh, the guy that came over from Spain, three of his four grandparents actually, their name was Vigil. It's uh, pretty hard to get, I mean, we're kind of like Spanish Habsburg level of intermarriage here. And this is something that I, I dug up, uh, Catalina de Arguez, her, uh, she had two grandparents that were Arguez, and then three grandparents that were from the Quiros family. So there's a lot of intermarriage among the uh, local elites. Now, this is not actually Juan uh, Montes Vigil II, but it's a picture of his cousin, Don John of Austria. And uh, this is just how I give an idea. He was around 13 or 14 years old when he decided to uh, leave his home and come, come to America. In 1611, uh, I'm not sure. This is one of the V Hill palaces in the Sierra area. There are five or six. I'm not sure which one he would have lived in, but it gives you an idea of uh, when most people were living in huts at the time. You know, when we think of palaces, sometimes we think of like Versailles or, or whatever. But this was, uh, you know, he had a very nice lifestyle, certainly for, for that time. And this is actually the Church of San Martin that is still standing to this day. You can go there, and there's the interior of it. And, this is probably, those are the very stones where Juan Montes Vigil II would have prayed when he left the, uh, everything behind for the new world. And he is the uh, founder of our family here in the, uh, in the Americas. Uh, we don't have any uh, 
have no idea why he left. Maybe his father had died. Maybe he was left an orphan. Maybe he was the younger son. Maybe he just had an adventurous spirit. But uh, he was the one. The, the others, as far as we know, stayed behind. And he uh, came over and went to Mexico City, which in the 1600s was still uh, kind of like Boston during the colonial times. It was out there surrounded by water. And uh, he uh, came up in the f surfaces in the records in 1619 at the great cathedral in uh, Zacatecas in the north, the uh, great uh, mining town. That is where he marries a uh, Spanish woman named uh, Carolina Herrera uh, Cantiana. We don't really know much about the rest of his life. We know that uh, he had a daughter named Maria and then his son, Juan Montesujil III, born around 1625. He's important to us because he's the father of our Francisco uh, that uh, uh, came to uh, New Mexico. Uh, these are a picture of the sort of the cast at the time. When you have a um, Spanish person, an Espanol that married a Negra, a, a black woman, their child would be called a mulatto. And that is what happened with our Francisco Montes Vigil. His father uh, had a liaison with a woman who was a, at least, she may have been African, she may have been half African, part Indian, but definitely was somebody from one of the, uh, considered the lower castes, and they had a child, and that was Francisco. And then uh, later on, when he got married, when he got, was older, uh, as a mulatto, he married an Española. This is this uh, Maria Jimenez de Anciso that came with him in 1695 to New Mexico. And so technically, uh, in New Spain, their children would have been classified as Moriscos, but that was not part of the terminology, at least that I've seen in uh, in New Mexico. Now, under uh, we all know Don Diego de Vargas, who led the reconquest. Uh, the this was the leader when when they came, the Spanish came back, settled in Santa Fe there, and that was where the Vigil family was really centered for a number of years. And uh, Francisco became a career soldier at the Presidio. You kind of get a sense here of how the soldiers at that time would have dressed. And uh, his sons, Francisco II, Juan, Manuel, Domingo, all uh, continued that military tradition, serving in many different campaigns. Uh, uh, the Viasur expedition is probably the most famous one that Francisco took part of, where they went out on the plains out to Nebraska in a terrible defeat. One third of the Spanish forces probably uh, lost their lives, but somehow Francisco survived that. And after this, he uh, was near retirement age, and he went up to the Santa Cruz area. This is an aerial view of the Santa Cruz area. And the V Hill family became centered in, their center of gravity for the family was Santa Cruz. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're all familiar with the 1790 census. There were 157 V Hills living in New Mexico by that time, and 91, or 60% of them, lived in the Santa Cruz area. Uh, over the years, the family continued to spread out, and then in 1821, the key event was the independence of, of uh, Mexico from Spain. Uh, Spanish rule ended, and the idea, ideology of racial equality was fostered. That was a big change from how things had been under the Spanish. And so we see these terms phased out, mestizo, mulatto, and so forth, because everybody's just a citizen of the uh, Mexican Republic. Uh, the American immigrants flooded in. We all know that story. And uh, 46, the Americans uh, took over New Mexico. Uh, some of the members of the V. Hill family had very close ties. Uh, this is a picture of uh, uh, some people may recognize of Josefa Jaramillo, who was uh, uh, mother Apollonia, was a member of the V. Hill family, who was married to Kit Carson. And her uh, sister Ignacia was married to Governor Charles Bent who was the first governor that the uh, American uh, forces appointed. Uh, Donaciano B. Hill became the uh, governor of New Mexico after the uh, uprisings in 1846. And he's a, uh, I believe, my opinion is he hasn't been really given respect by the history books. Most uh, historians today who tend to be sort of progressive or leftist uh, kind of characterize him as a sellout, but I, I think that uh, I admire him a lot because I think he had a very difficult situation that he faced and really worked for reconciliation between the Anglos and the Hispanos. And I think if somebody else would have been in that office at the time, 
there might have been more violence, uh, there might have been more divisions, and so uh, I think he really was a credit to the uh, to the Vigil family. But at at this point among historians, that's probably a minority view, but that's the the uh, the view I have. The family really the center of gravity of the family. Uh, Moved, moved to Taos. So we're going north. We start in Santa Fe, then we go to uh, Santa Cruz, and now we're up in Taos. As a matter of fact, the 1850 census, the first one taken by the uh, new American government, 47% of the V Hills lived in the Taos area, Taos County. And that There were 900. We're up to 906 uh, V Hills now. So the Civil War, as we know, broke out in 1861. 4,000 uh, Hispanics from New Mexico took part, including, uh, this is Major Rafael Chacon. He later was a prominent pioneer in southern Colorado. He's a direct descendant of uh, Francisco Montes V. Hill. I mentioned a little about him in the, uh, my book. Uh, the Battle of Glorieta Pass, which uh, is an uh, important part of New Mexico history, where Colorado and New Mexico soldiers together drove off the uh, Confederate, the Texan in, uh, invasion. And uh, after the war ended, the, uh, we had a great movement of people. Um, by between the late 1860s and uh, 1880, about one-fourth of all of the Hispano people of New Mexico crossed over the border, moved into southern Colorado, the San Luis Valley and the, the central part of Colorado there. And uh, you really had a division for the first time because before that, the Hispano people had been pretty much limited to the state of New Mexico. Now the group was divided between two uh, states and there were many V Hills that went north and were very prominent, founding a lot of the communities and so forth to the north. This map, by the way, I'd like to point out is from a book, I don't know, uh, some people here may be familiar with this, by Richard Alnostrand, uh, a geographer. This is really a wonderful book in terms of uh, helping us understand the the space and how this part of the world has been, been shaped by the, uh, the Hispanic people in so many ways. There was a, a wonderful tradition of uh, military service that continued the Vigil family. This is Alfonso Vigil who joined the U.S. Army during World War I. He died of illness at the age of 17. He's buried in Taos County. And then a cousin of his, Ernest Marcelino Vigil, came from a small town in southern Colorado, joined the army. He died in the South Pacific in June of 1942. He was only 23. And you could just, it was hard doing that part of the book because really there were a hundred or more people I could have mentioned who really uh, played an important part in, in the different wars. Uh, this is somebody I'd like to introduce that I was not familiar with before I, I did this research. <coughs> This is uh, Carmelita V. Hill Schimenti, who was the uh, career officer in the United States Air Force and the first Hispanic woman to ever become a uh, general. She was appointed a brigadier general by President Reagan in uh, 1985. Now, speaking about the V. Hills over time, this is a, a graphic that I think is really very um, interesting. As I said, thank you. We uh, started out with seven people in this family. You had a mom and dad and five kids in 1697. By the time of the 1750 Spanish census, 63 V. Hills, 1790, 157. 1850, the first American census, as I already mentioned, 900. By 1900, 2400. By 1940, just before the U.S. got involved in the Second World War, 5600. And today, 22,442. So this, uh, many things can be said about this family, but uh, one thing that cannot be said is that they ignored the command to go forth and multiply, you know, be fruitful and, and multiply. Uh, there are now uh, V. Hills, besides those groups that I mentioned there, living in all 50 states in the District of Columbia. And today, for the first time, uh, this probably happened maybe Fifteen years ago or so, there are more V Hills in Colorado than in New Mexico. There are about 9,300 living in Colorado. There are about 7,700 in New Mexico and 5,500 in California. So today this family really has their three focuses of, of this family. Um, so that's just sort of going into some of the information in my book. I just ran through it very 
quickly to just kind of get, give you an idea. Now, one of the things I want to talk about uh, now, this is the second part, where I'm going to talk a little about just the general subject of doing genealogical research in medieval Asturias, but most, a lot of this would apply to all of, uh, all of Spain. First, I want to just be sure what we're all on one page when I talk about what we mean by uh, the uh, medieval world. Uh, historians use classifications generally would call the uh, ancient world being from about the dawn of history, 3200 BC, down to the time of Homer, say 750 BC. That would be the ancient world. Then from about 750 BC to the fall of the Roman Empire, 476 AD, that would be the classical period. This is a view of the form of Rome when Rome was at its height. Then from 476 AD to 1492 is the medieval world. This is, of course, the great uh, Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris. And uh, steel mill represents the modern world, 1492 to about 1989. We're dating that to the dawn of the internet as sort of the birth of the, the postmodern age. So when we're talking about the Middle Ages, we're talking about that period from 476 to 1492. It's about a thousand years or 33 generations. Um, one of the things that's interesting, I think, as, as genealogists, it's good for us to think of human history not just in terms of years, but in terms of generations. That is about, about 30 generations. And so written history probably goes back 173 generations, if you want to keep that number in mind. And uh, something that I think is interesting, uh, somebody asked me, well, what's the farthest back that you go? Uh, as I mentioned, there are legends and so forth, but the, the line that we have that is most solidly documented goes back to this character, Fergus Moore, King of Dalriada, who uh, was born around the year 450. Uh, this was a uh, Celtic area, probably what we would now call uh, Northern Ireland, and uh, he goes back 52 generations from the present time. Does anybody have any idea what might be the farthest generation, uh, the oldest lineage in the world? What part of the world or what family? I would say Chinese. Chinese. Does anybody else have any uh, thoughts? Actually, you're, you're, you're right on. You're, you're correct. The uh, oldest documented lineage in the world at the present time goes back to the philosopher Confucius, Kung Fu Tzu, was born around 550 BC, 80 generations ago. Uh, today, a billion and a half people still sort of live by his teachings. And here's a picture of the family of Confucius today. The uh, fellow sitting there on the chair is the grandfather, Kong Te Jing, who was the 78th, uh, 78th lineal descendant. Then there's his grandson at the top, uh, Kong Sui Chang, uh, born in 1975. And then that little guy in the middle, Kung Yu Jen, uh, born 2006, he will be the 80th lineal descendant of Columbus, or Columbus, Confucius. <laughs> and here you see, uh, it's the largest family in the world. This was just published uh, sometime within the last five years, I believe. Uh, 83 generations of the genealogy of the descents of Confucius. Two million names are listed in those books, and that's uh, by far the largest uh, documented family in, in, the, uh, in the world. But now getting back to the Middle Ages, I think when you want to do genealogy in the Middle Ages and you want to understand it, you have to see we're looking, dealing with people who live in a very different world than we do today. So on the left, I have what you call the medieval worldview, and on the right, the modern. Uh, a big difference, they lived religion. Uh, we live in a secular society. People back then lived religious. Religion permeated everything. Uh, we today have religious diversity. Back then in the West, it was really Catholicism was the only religion. Of course, you had Jews and a few groups that were, but most people were by and large Catholic. Uh, in terms of politics, today we're citizens of a republic. In those days, people were subjects of a crown. You have a whole different way of uh, exercising your political rights by those. Uh, capital accumulation, today we have that. Back then, we did not. Uh, Economic dynamism. Today you hear the complaint from people, why is everything changing? You know, buildings are constantly being built and torn down and, and, and nothing stays the same. Whereas in the Middle Ages, there's economic stagnation. I mean, you could visit a village 100, 200, 300 years later and it was pretty much going to be 
the same church, the same houses. Uh, there just wasn't capital like there is today to really uh, change things. Uh, and this is, uh, oh, social mobility today. You see a lot of people, people end up being millionaires or whatever, who started life very poor. In those days, society was very stratified. I mean, if you were poor, you were probably going to be poor the rest of your life. And this is one that's very important that I think a lot of people overlook, and that's identity. Uh, in those days, your identity was given. Today, people kind of have to find an identity. This is where I think a lot of our uh, young pe how a lot of our young people get lost. You know, we expect somebody when they're in high school to kind of like say, well, what kind of job are you going to do? What are you going to be? What are you going to contribute to the world? That's a big responsibility, but people today have freedom, you know, to different degrees. And in those days, it was really sort of, you knew who you were when you were born, and you stayed in your place. Uh, today, we're very much into individualism. In those days, it was all about loyalty to your group, whoever, however you define that group. Americans, especially today, have this can-do attitude if there's a problem. We can fix it. In the Middle Ages, you had fatalism. People were just used to plagues and floods and all of these tragedies and, and just really kind of just accepted their lot. Uh, today, the big thing is personal integrity. Be true to yourself. The code in those days, it was all about honor. You can't stress that enough when we're talking about the Middle Ages. These are people for whom honor was everything. Honor was worth dying for. Honor was worth killing for. Uh, today, we supposedly have gender equality, even though that's not always the case. Back then, it was just, you read things in the Middle Ages and you just see how women were treated terribly as second-class citizens. Uh, today we have a lifespan generally of, of uh, five phases that are recognized. Uh, you have childhood, you have teenage years, young adulthood, mature adulthood, and then you have the um, golden years or senior years. In those days, you really only had two. Uh, people were kids and then you were adults. You know, you didn't have, uh, so that kind of uh, is a very different thing. The average lifespan today is 80 years, you know, if you make it out of childhood. In those days, it was about 50 years. So people really lived kind of at an accelerated speed. So many of the people that you say, these kings and so forth, were people in their 20s, uh, getting, mar getting married when they're 20 and then having their kids and in many cases being dead by the time they're 30 or 35. So that's a whole different way of living than, than we're accustomed to today. And now these are uh, particular to royalty and nobility, the people that we're studying here. I can't stress again how violence was endemic. When you read about medieval history, it's almost like you read about the mafia because it really, that's how it was. You have a position that's high. You have to defend it constantly. You're always under attack. Somebody's always ready to stab you in the back or try to take what you have. Uh, people did not have time to think out a strategy. You live from day to day, so as I mean by tactical rather than strategic. And you were not a free individual. You had feudal obligations both from the bottom and the top. If you're a lord, you were, there were certain things you were supposed to do for the people that uh, were your clients. And then you had to offer your service to the king or emperor, to the people that were above you. And we talked about loyalty and honor. And your loyalty was not to you as an individual, to your immediate family group, to your mom and dad. It was to your house, your, your family. Every, that's what counted, loyalty to your house above house. And then especially here in Spain, you find this constant quest for glory, that that's really what it's all about. It isn't about uh, knowledge. It isn't about wealth. It isn't about uh, spiritual perfection. It isn't about personal satisfaction. It's about uh, glory. It's about winning fame, uh, kind of like that warrior ethos. So uh, that's you know what I'm talking about uh, up there. So... Uh, in terms of the records, you see here kind of the battles we have. The, um, getting back to the sort of sources that you would use, we have to remember parchment was rare, and so written records during this time are going to be uh, very expensive, and so the only records that we're going to have are really for the elite, for the monarchs, for the nobles, and you're not going to have sacramental records like we do now. I think we often... Uh, take those for granted, but those are just sort of things that go back to the Council of Trent, to the mid-1500s, where we assume, you, you know, just find a parish and you're going to have the baptismal records, the marriage records, the uh, uh, burial records. Uh, that, that is not something that you, you are going to see in the Middle Ages. Uh, so the primary records that we're using are going to be things like royal decrees, which are government documents, uh, marriage contracts, wills, 
and then donations to churches and monasteries. Oh, yes, you have a question. Another good source, these lineage books that you can find on uh, um, Google Books or uh, the Internet Archive where people have actually gone and they have taken these primary sources and, uh, and uh, you know, done in interesting things with them. So these are some books I'd like to mention that are notable if you're really serious about medieval Spanish genealogy. Uh, something that is free for everybody on Google Books, it's this Nobiliario of the Conde de Barcelos, and uh, it was written, I believe, in the, like around 1400 or so, but uh, the edition that they have in print is from 1646, and this covers really just about all of the noble families of Spain. Uh, has some very good information in there. Uh, for Asturias, the, the volume that, uh, that I have here, uh, Josef Manuel Tres Via de Moros, this Asturias Illustrada, it was published in 1760, eight volumes. That really gives you a very thorough history of all of the noble families of uh, Asturias, and it's, uh, it's very accurate. I found very few uh, things that have had to be corrected in, in that particular book. Uh, two things from a more contemporary times. This Francisco uh, Pefero did a, a six-volume series about the kings and the lords of, of Spain. And this Francisco Fernandez de Bedcourt did a uh, genealogy and uh, genealogical and heraldic history of the Spanish monarchy, ten volumes. Uh, two books that are by modern scholars. They have a great deal of information. Very well done. Simon Barton, a uh, British scholar, did a study of the aristocracy in 12th century Leon and Castile. And uh, Margarita Torres Sevilla Quinones de Leon uh, did this study, uh, Linajes Dobilarios en Leon y Castilla, during the, uh, from the 9th to the 13th century. So that's sort of an uh, uh, important book. These are journals, scholarly journals, many of which you can find online that deal, and I mention those in, in my book, that deal with uh, the medieval history of Spain. There's a lot of work being done now that's uh, very important and very useful to genealogists. There's the uh, thing. Uh, um, one thing that I want to, I'm trying to move, pick up the pace here a little bit. Uh, for those who have done work in uh, England in terms of the Middle Ages, the big difference I found, you have a uh, quite a few uh, less in terms of, of ranks. In Spain you really had on one level you had the king or the different kings and you really only have two basic types of nobles. You have the counts and then you have the senors and uh, it's not really a big distinction but a senor is just sort of a lord of a certain place or the lord of a particular of a house. By house they mean a, a family, a clan as it were. In England you know you had like dukes, marquises, counts, viscounts, barons and in, in Spain, it's much, uh, it's a much simpler picture. And then, of course, you have the Hidalgos, who are sort of like the nobles that, do, that uh, don't really have a, um, a, a patrimony, so to speak. Um, I want to say just a, a word about patronymics. Those are important. Um, it's very important to not confuse patronymics with surnames. Uh, the surnames, as we know them, didn't really arise until after the 1400s. Uh, probably more universal until the 1500s. Uh, from probably the 800s up through the 1400s, you have patronymics. So uh, that's how people would identify themselves. So when it says down there, Pedro Diaz de Castaneda, when they say Pedro Diaz, they don't mean that, that he's a member of the Diaz family. Diaz means son of Diego. Uh, his father is Diego Gomez. That doesn't mean his name's Gomez. It means he's Diego, the son of Gomez. It's just sort of like you see with Russia, where you see things like, you know, Yuri Vladimirovich or, or so forth. Uh, and that can cause confusion if you, you haven't studied a little about that. Uh, one of the, this can be serious and kind of stodgy at times, but one of the things that I think is, is fun about <coughs> studying medieval geology are these uh, sobriquets or nicknames. And a lot of them are very boring, like somebody would be called, you know, the, the old or the young the wise or whatever, but some of these are, 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 are striking. For instance, this Nuno Guterres, they called him de los cuatro manos, uh, the four hands, because he was so fierce in battle, it's like he had four hands uh, handling his weapons. Uh, Guterres Rodriguez de Castro, uh, Al Descalabrado, the head injured, 
he had gotten like a sword or something smashed over his head and I guess it left a, you know, kind of a noticeable mark. Uh, these are all ancestors of Francisco Montes uh, The one that I found is kind of funny there, the third one, Malcolm the Third, King of Scotland, Cadmore means big head, so uh, <laughs> they, could, they could be insulting. Almost all the cases, these are, are men, but I did find, there's one woman in Franciscan's ancestry, this uh, French lady, Amauberge de Lille Bouchard, and if you can imagine this, a thousand years later, she's still known to historians, uh, historians as La Dangerous. So you kind of wonder, you know, that must have been quite a personality. Here's a picture of uh, Malcolm III, by the way, and you can see, I don't think it's so much he has a big head, I just think it's that, that hat, that helmet, isn't, uh, isn't very flattering. Um, trying to move along here, this is the third part where I'm going to do a representative lineage of Francisco Montes Vigil. Because, you know, sometimes if people say, because I actually had somebody write to me and say this, uh, you know, you know, you're telling me you've written a book where you've, you've gone back to the year 500 or something, and can you, I want to see some evidence. How do I know, you know, you're not making this up? And so uh, I want to just give you one lineage here. Now, let's start with this Esteban de Arguelles. That's somebody that everybody knows is a ancestor Francisco. That goes back to that work that Marietta and Jose and uh, Charles did. And how do I know that her, uh, his mother was Juana de Quiroz? I found it there on that uh, page 122 of Book 1 of Volume 3 of Asturias Illustrata. Now, what about Juana? Well, her father was the Count of San Antolin, the Conde de San Antolin. It's Juan Bernardo de Quiroz y Quijada. Uh, how do I know that? That was in, in that book, Volume 3, Book 1. Now, for the Count, his mother was Sancha Quijada. That uh, reference is uh, from Asturias Illustrata, Volume 2, Book 3, pages 233 to 234. Sancha Quijada, her mother was a Lasso de Vega. She was a lady in her own right. She actually inherited this title as the lady of the Torre de Mormojón. The Lasso de Vegas. Now, her uh, mother was the Castaneda, Juana de Castaneda. <coughs> On page 95, they mention uh, Maria Teresa being the daughter of uh, Garcilaso de la Vega and Juana de Castaneda. Uh, now another book here by Luis de Salazar Castro, someone who has, is very prolific. If you look for him on uh, World, the uh, Internet Archive or Google Books, you'll find a lot of the things that he's done. And uh, he identified the mother of Juana de Castaneda as a mayor Alfonso de Salada. See, sometimes the women also will use uh, patronymics. Uh, she gets that because her father, or mother was, Alf or, well, yeah, her father was Alfonso, and his wife was the daughter of an Alfonso. In this source, we're going back to Asturias Illustrata. Um, this is another different book here. These are um, memoirs of uh, historical records for Don Alonso, Alfonso the Wise, and uh, this. Alfonso up here, Senor de Molina, that was the father of Lorenzo, he is important because he is the son of a king, Alfonso the Ninth, who uh, I showed you an illustration before of him who was married to the daughter of a king of Castile. And here's a different printed source, reputable source that gives that information of how we know he's uh, the, uh, the, the king. And so to sum it up, this is how you're able to... Uh, Go then to uh, put together 10 generations, 259 years, and this is what I have in my book. There are, uh, uh, I've just shown you, you know, what is that, uh, eight or nine linkages. There are, there are a thousand in there showing how people are related, and each one is documented, and so people are, are free to go ahead and check that out. And uh, what I'd like to, there's uh, uh, Alfonso the Ninth. What I'd like to say again to stress is uh, we only had to go back with my research uh, 238 years to get to medieval royalty because the work that people like Jose Antonio Escobar, Marietta Vigil Gonzalez had done had really taken us almost halfway there. So anytime we do genealogy, we're building on those, the work of those who've come before. It, it really is a collaborative effort. It isn't just sort of, you know, people... Um, um, 
you know, working as, as individuals. Okay, now I, I just want to share a few concluding observations I have. Uh, I have a couple of pictures here of scenes we've seen on the news of demonstrations and so forth. And I think we can all agree here, regardless of our politics or how we look at the world, we're living in a time of great stress and great anxiety, a lot of divisions. Uh, it's, it seems at times the world is, is, is falling apart. Uh, a lot of old familiar things are dying. New things are being born that are unfamiliar. Companies like Sears are going down the drain. Companies like Amazon.com are just making billions of dollars and raking in more and more all the time. Um, things like the coal industry are shrinking. But then you have the telecom industry that's uh, continuing to grow. And we're, we're really living at a turning point in history. It's the end of the modern era, birth of the postmodern era. In terms of our economy, we're moving out of the industrial age into the post-industrial age. And then in terms of that change in the United States, uh, there are a couple of really good historians, William Strauss and Neil Howe, who talk about we're living at a, a fourth turning point in American history. The first great turning point was the revolution that gave birth to our country in the 1770s. Then we had the uh, Civil War in the 1860s. Then we had this collective, this uh, uh, great trauma that our nation went through during the Great Depression and World War II. And that's the sort of world that is in the process of ending now. And this fourth transition that we're going through, uh, people aren't really sure what it, what it means. We don't know exactly what is going to be left, what is, what is uh, going, going to go down. But I think that explains why the times we live in are very frightening to so many people. And I think when we study history, when we study genealogy, hopefully it helps us put things in uh, perspective. And I come back again to this picture, even though it's uh, Don John of Austria as a child, I like to think of it as uh, similar to what Juan Montes Vigil the second would have been. And, uh, you know, we th I think of somebody like him, how much courage he must have had. Um, I don't know about anybody here, but for me, when I was like 13 or 14 years old, the last thing I would want to have done would be to have just set out, go to their side of the world and start over. But he had the courage to do that. And he made history. He changed history because to this day, uh, as I said, there are about 22,000 V. Hills now living in the United States. There are only about 2,800 in Spain. So he changed the whole course of this V. Hill family. It would be just this little group living in, in, in Spain, in Asturias. Uh, but there's this whole wonderful chapter, uh, people who have contributed so much to our country. And uh, uh, the rest of this I've just kind of talked about. The, uh, uh, one, one thing I'd like to say, of course, this is the uh, founding here of Santa Fe. Uh, I, I believe genealogy, genealogy is very important. We all do, or we wouldn't be here. And I don't like when people tell me it's about the past, why you live in the past. Because I really believe that genealogy is, it's not about the past. It's about knowing who we are in the present so that we're able to face the future and to prepare our families to face the future. And our uh, people, the Hispano people, came into being 18 generations ago in the uh, Rio Grande Valley. And I think the more we know our story, the better prepared we'll be to, to face whatever the world has to, to throw at us. Uh, these two pictures here, of course, are Mary, the mother of Jesus, and uh, Joseph, St. Joseph. I think it's very telling that here we are, 43 generations since the Battle of Covadonga, 18 generations since the founding of New Mexico. The most popular names among members of the V. Hill family for boys are Joseph and Jose, and for women, Maria and Mary. And I think that kind of continuity really speaks to the strength and the, and the character of, uh, of our people. And so I think as long as uh, we can really uh, learn our heritage and pass it on, find our strength in it, that uh, we'll, we'll be okay and we'll still be here uh, 18, 18 generations from, from now. So, thank you.